So if you're somebody who follows me on social media, you'll be aware that over the last couple of weeks I've been going through quite a lot uh, medically. So I had my wisdom tooth out two weeks ago and I'm not going to go into too much detail because this is not, you know, Kate's medical history and because you might potentially be eating your lunch while you're watching this and I don't want to make you feel nauseous. Um, but basically it did this thing called dry socket where it's extremely painful and it didn't heal properly and it still hasn't healed properly and I've had f further surgery um, yesterday. And I'm not, as I say, I'm not going to go into super details about that, but it's brought to my attention something very specific. When you're in pain and tooth pain is supposed to be one of the worst pains out there, what the medical experts do is they recommend that you take, for example, paracetamol and you start taking paracetamol and when that's not enough, then they suggest you add an NSAID, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug like ibuprofen or aspirin or naproxen, methanamic acid. There are various ones depending on what kind of pain you've got. I've been on ibuprofen. Um, and then when that isn't enough, because uh, there's obviously a maximum amount of that that you can take per day and you have to space out doses. When that isn't enough, the next thing they recommend is moving on to an opiate, which would be codeine, tramadol or morphine. And there's a problem with moving on to those things which is that those drugs are highly, highly addictive. And, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time in talking to various medical experts this week saying, no, 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 do take some codeine because you're in too much pain to sleep. And if you can't sleep, that's going to, you know, slow down the healing process and so on and so forth. And other medical experts saying, try not to take so much codeine. And going backwards and forwards, people suggesting whether I should move on to tramadol um, or morphine, and people suggesting how I can try to minimise that. Now, in the middle of this process, for legal reasons, I went to Amsterdam for an hour and a half. Um, because what I did was I, a, a friend of mine gave me some pot brownies when we were in Amsterdam, which we definitely went to. We were 100% in Amsterdam, not in London, where pot is illegal and I would never take it. Um, and... You know, cannabis is another kind of pain relief and it made me feel kind of spaced out and it made me feel a little bit trippy, if I'm honest with you, and in a not unpleasant way. And it meant that I was able to go a few more hours without taking paracetamol and without taking ibuprofen. And it meant that actually that day um, that I had access to the pot brownies, I actually didn't need to take codeine. And the point is this, cannabis is way, way, way less addictive than opiates are. And it would be so easy for the government to make it legal to medically prescribe cannabis. The side effects and the addictiveness are so, so, so much lower than things that are prescribed, like opiates. It's ridiculous. We're putting people onto drugs that are much more dangerous than other drugs that are available. And the only reason the government isn't making cannabis legal for medical use is because they're afraid of this kind of hardline lobby. Oh, you know, if people let people take cannabis, it'll only lead to them turning into, I don't know, rioters or all ending up, or they'll all end up on heroin, which of course is an opiate. People will end up on heroin if you get them addicted to codeine and then take their codeine away. If you give them, the whole thing is ridiculous. Um, and if people are worried that providing cannabis for medical reasons is going to lead to young people having access to cannabis, uh, let me tell you three things about that. Firstly, young people already have access to cannabis. It's incredibly easy to get cannabis on the streets of Britain. It's, it's available everywhere. It doesn't matter how tiny the little village you live in is. Honestly, there's probably somebody at the post office selling it. Everybody I know has access to cannabis if they want it. The only people who aren't taking cannabis are the ones who don't want to, which most of the time is me. But when I'm in this much pain, is not me. Um, secondly, if the market had more medical grade cannabis on it, that would actually stop young people from accessing non-medical grade cannabis. When people are buying things illegally on the street, it's really hard to check what it is that they're buying. And that's where the biggest danger of cannabis use comes in. When they're buying something, they don't know how strong it is. It doesn't come with any kind of warning about, about what it's suitable to use for, what a maximum dosage is, what they should be taking, what they shouldn't be taking. Um, and we don't know who's produced it. And we honestly don't know whether they've actually got cannabis, whether they've just given you some bag of herbs, some bag of, you know, whatever they've dragged off a roadside virgin dried. We don't know what they're giving you. And you might be smoking something that is actually much worse for you than cannabis. You know, like, for example, nicotine. What if they've given you tobacco? That's much more... Da oh, hang on. You can just buy tobacco, can't you, over the counter? Um, and thirdly, people are worried that, you know, teenagers will somehow be able to access medical cannabis. Now, let me tell you, 10 years ago, 
um, my then mother-in-law was living in California and she was given medical cannabis where medical cannabis is legal in California and I'm not gonna lie to you she was absolutely offering it to people at Christmas she absolutely was saying hey if anybody wants to try cannabis you can and is there a better way to discourage young people from taking drugs and to make sure that they do so in a safe and regulated environment than by giving it to their mother-in-law, to their grandparents, to their elderly and infirm relatives. Like, could you make cannabis less cool than letting your mother-in-law give it to you? I mean, actually, this is a great way of getting kids to spend Christmas with their grandparents, isn't it? Granny's got some pot. Isn't pot brownies the one thing that would make family Christmas a little bit more tolerable for everybody involved? This has literally no downsides and the upside is that we could stop Britain turning into America where the opiate addiction crisis is completely out of control and thousands and thousands of people are having their lives completely ruined by it. And we won't take a step along that road for fear of offending some kind of super right-wing person who is, can't be bothered to read the actual medical evidence. It's nonsense. Make Christmas great again. Prescribe cannabis to everybody's granny. Thank you.